Thanks, Eddie. I'm just waiting for this to come up. Uh, yeah, so first of, first of all, just like to thank uh, Noonga, uh, Wajak Noonga elders, uh, past, present and into the future, and acknowledge that it's on your land that we've gathered, but also to acknowledge traditional owners across the state. It's your heritage we're discussing today. Um, this is a beautiful picture from the Pilbara. Um, so as Eddie said, my co-speaker uh, is Sharon, um, and, but she's stuck in Fiji because of uh, COVID sort of situation. It's sort of interrupted us a little bit, but we worked out um, over a period of um, WhatsApp uh, discussions and me pointing the, the, the phone at the computer. We've kind of cobbled this bit of a talk together. Uh, this is Sharon. She's a Bidj uh, Bidjigali uh, Nyangamata woman from the Sandy Desert. And it's kind of a shame she's not here because she's actually a, be a beautiful speaker and she's very passionate about talking about communities in particular. Um, so, under state um, legislation, heritage is often reduced to a process of land administration. There are other things, but it's not much more than that. But heritage is a lot more than part of the approvals process or some legislative template in recording things and in recording places. So what is it? This picture, by the way, is Bufalonia in the Pilbara. I won't discuss that. It's just an extraordinary place, though. So if we would talk to any other culture in, in the world, they wouldn't be talking about their heritage as being a set of, uh, let's say, in, in Britain, uh, ruined castles and uh, Neolithic tombs and nothing much else. It in, is, in fact, if, if we take this example from Scotland, it's everything about being Scottish. It's what your Scottish uh, parents and grandparents hand down to the children and what you hopefully will instill in them to be, to be proud of your cultural heritage. And it includes, in this case, your, you know, your tartan, your bagpipes, the haggis, the wonderful story about why the wild haggis has longer legs on one side than the other. Uh, Loch Ness and the Highland Games, the great heroes, the heroes uh, William Wallace in this case. Um, uh, the, their scientists, their comedians, even the football teams that they support, Celtic uh, Football Club in this case. So heritage is really about what one generation gives to, enough, uh, to another, and it's to take some pride in those cultural traditions. And that's true of cultures all over the world. That heritage, and Sharon would make this point so strongly, is about community. So in legislation, we often talk about knowledge holders and uh, informants and so on. Um, but in the wider scope in terms of heritage, it's actually about entire communities. It's the heritage of a collective. And it's through heritage that they often express their cultural identity and take a sense of pride. So heritage, uh, in her sense, because we're talking about living communities, heritage is a living dynamic thing. Melinda. Uh, so for any vibrant culture, heritage is lived experience. So that's, you know, it can be collecting bush tucker and hunting and talking to parts of the land and so on. It's just as much about sitting on country or interacting with country as it is considering where artifacts might be stored, which is really basically the approvals process. So it's often part of the living traditions of First Nations peoples. So although archeologists encounter this, anthropologists, uh, this is not unusual on a sort of heritage survey process where people take a little bit of time out to collect, in this case, desert walnuts and witchetty grubs uh, Elaine's caught a lovely fish at lunchtime and so on. So it's heritage is about living your culture and interacting it and renewing it and, and in a sense paying respect to the land by having that uh, continued interaction. And this is the thing that Sharon would have uh, really liked to have talked about. She feels that heritage is so much about teaching. In this case, uh, teaching the young for the old. So again, well, again, while there's an awful emphasis put on you know, elder people, which there should be, there should be a level of respect for the knowledge they have. She says, it, you know, and I know this, every time you go out with elders, one of the things that they say over and over is young people need to be here. We need to involve them. We need to hand this on. We need to instill in them a sense of pride and knowledge about their heritage so that they can carry it on. And so, um, and when we go on surveys, Sharon does this enormously and she talks to uh, she, there's a whole thing about talking to young, having younger people there to teach them. Uh, but she will expand that and I'll make the later point is it's also about teaching non-Aboriginal people about culture. And I'll make that point again a little bit later. 
So uh, through the WhatsApp, uh, me and Sharon going back and forth uh, uh, late at night, I got some lovely little quotes from her. Um, so I'll just have to read them here. Um, we have to teach the young, like incubate them, teach them, like heritage is for us. And she goes on to say that proponents sometimes think it's a tick box exercise in some agreement, but it's our heritage, she says. And when we're on country, we have responsibilities. When we're on survey, for example, we go into country mode, we fall back into the land. It has an energy. We're checking places, we feel the wind, we smell the earth. And she goes on, she gives lots of other examples. Uh, I couldn't put them all in. Um, we have to keep that area going for the goannas, for the plants, for the birds. And when we say goanna in English, it's a lizard. But when we say it in language, murundal, it has a meaning, it has a story. It is connected to everything else in that place. And she gives lots of other examples there as well. It's like the whole country comes alive. And then she, we spent a long time for different examples and then she summed it up. This interconnection is the soul of country. And thank you for that phone. <laughs> um, and the converse like that, if we want to destroy the soul of a people, then we only just think about, you know, the Taliban blowing up those great Buddha statues or the German uh, forces in Belarus destroying every church, every art gallery, every museum. It's to bring people down. It destroys their soul by attacking their heritage. It brings them down. So the, the opposite of that is if you take pride in heritage, you conserve it, you enhance it, you celebrate it, people have a sense of well-being. They feel good. They feel connected. They're proud of it, as they should be. And so much of this is built around notions of cultural respect, which itself is often based on notions of looking after country or caring for country. So uh, even though there are people in this room who talk uh, better about this than I could, I'll just take on some of um, Sharon's comments here. So uh, just uh, briefly, when she talks about respect, and some of it you will have heard this, is talking about respect, relationships of respect to the land, to the spirits and the life forces of the land, to understand balance in the land, that is that plants and animals have a place. And while life and death may be a part of the natural cycle, when you have unfettered destruction, unfettered death, then that balance is ruined and that, and that level of respect has been diminished. And so that's a damaging thing. Um, so, okay, well, we kind of all know that. So what does that mean if you're a traditional owner and you're a proponent? What does that mean in the uh, sort of modern context? This picture, by the way, are two Robe River Gurma fellas, Mark Lockyer, and behind him is Neil Finlay. Um, um, and some of you will recognize this uh, ritual of respect. Neil's taken a mouthful of water at this important site. He sprayed it back out. He's talking in language. He's saying to country in language, you know, uh, we're here, we haven't come to harm you, we've brought some visitors, you know, it's, it's basically making peace with the land and showing a level of respect. And that's a common thing, particularly on ethnographic surveys, but I'm sure archaeologists have experienced this as well. And of course, traditional owners will be very familiar with this. Um, so Sharon gives this example. She said, uh, if you're a proponent, you have to knock on the door. That, that's comments been made to me by a number of elders, including Michael Woodley from India Buddy and many others. Um, and by knocking on the door isn't to say, well, you know, we've negotiated with your lawyers and here's the agreement. And, yeah, can we go out and do a survey, please? Um, that's not what she means. The knocking on the door is this, it's the recognition that you're the gatekeeper, that it's our land, you've knocked on their door, so you're showing a level of respect. Um, so then she gives on examples, you know, if you went somewhere else and she gave some examples of Malaysia as a tourist, she said, you go to Malaysia and they have certain rules and it might be that if you're near a temple there, you have to walk along the path and you wear a sarong to cover your legs when you go in the temple. She said, that's about following the rules, showing a level of respect. So when they come knocking on the door and they're talking to us, we're able to tell them where they can go, where they can't go, what they can do, what they can't do, who they should be with. It's about us, like we're the people who open the door. It's about us establishing those rules. And those rules are, are around the notion of respect. What's happening here? Gonorica, a just truly remarkable place. Um, I won't go into too much discussion about that. But cultural landscapes. Okay, so they can be defined in many different ways, but a common way for them to be defined in uh, 
in WA is through intangible elements of heritage and that intangible is that non-physical elements of heritage that's often spirituality or a dream time myth a song line is a very good example the woggle in the swan river is another good example in this case a comet or a meteorite or something that was fo uh, watched by indigenous people uh, across the pilbara for weeks saw a flaming thing in the sky and then it crashes into the earth it forms this great crescent and a piece breaks off and it lands seven kilometers uh, I think it's 11 kilometers down the range and it, it smashes into that and it forms a great water hole and to, to this day this fresh water seeps out of these rocks and and it's the giver of life and so there are and apart from the fact that there's so many grindstones there there's plenty of animals there and it's just an extraordinarily beautiful place but the point is that the range is connected by an override overriding narrative let's get to the heart of it guys so mining transforms landscapes and because cultural landscapes are rarely recorded in this wide scope and in effect have no legislative protection sadly that will be the case in the new act um, they are not often considered in planning design and yet it's not exactly an insurmountable task to design a soil heap so that it does not obscure the line of sight corridor between two hills with a connecting mythological narrative so let's be honest here. If you're going to have mining, obviously you're going to have impact. There's going to be a level of destruction. But because a lot of it's been sent around uh, objects and sites, these big areas, these big uh, uh, stories that go over connect hills and entire areas of country are not taken into the design project. Had they have been, and I can think of actual examples in the Pilbara, had they have been, the impact would have been reduced. It still can be reduced. Some significant points, no doubt there will be archaeologists in the room who are now confused, as well as some anthropologists and members of the uh, department. Uh, when I say significant, I mean significant and important points, just in case you were confused there. A little pretty of a shit joke there, but anyway. Um, and heritage is, well, I say heritage is dynamic, alive and changing. Are they in fact the same meaning? But heritage is alive it, and it's dynamic and it's alive because it's part of connected to living culture. Heritage is about experience, um, and, and Sharon would have made this point so beautifully in a way that I cannot do, but it's about interacting with the land and taking care of it and being part of it. Um, and these, these interactions are based around the notions of respect or if you like cultural respect. And again, she would have uh, really loved to have talked that heritage is about community. So it, it isn't just about, you know, we've got the most knowledgeable uh, elder, I mean, that, that's great. It is in fact, even for children who haven't yet been born, have a right to be born into a culture in which they will have the opportunity to be, to be taught their culture, to be proud that there's something there that they can grow up and they take those responsibilities on to continue those traditions of defending and enhancing and celebrating their heritage. And it's got to do with the quality of life. And I think, as I said before, you know, you destroy heritage, it's demeaning. The conference is all over the world and there's academic papers everywhere that will talk about how heritage is so integral to a sense of people's sense of well-being. And I think David, when he talks about sense of place, that's true of Aboriginal people, but it's actually true of everyone. Um, and again, Sharon would talk about education the old taking on the responsibilities to teach the young and it's through heritage that people express their cultural identity but she'd go a bit further and she she would say that that educational process is also about aboriginal people trying to teach or, or get across the feeling of the importance of heritage to non-aboriginal people a new dawn gosh well that's a trick photo that's actually a sunset that was my in joke <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, maybe, I don't know. Let's see. So I would say, irrespective of the inadequacies of legislation, and I could spend some time talking about that, um, improved engagement and improved heritage processes have developed between traditional owner groups and some proponents. Some of the um, uh, things that I've highlighted in this talk, some of those companies have sort of just sort of tipped their toes on, but it's not a template process. So while I welcome that, um, I really, really think that they could go a lot further. But more importantly, there's a lot of companies, the overwhelming majority of companies, that don't really deal with heritage in this process. 
five minutes, thank you. I'll, I think I'll do that. Um, so Sharon and I are of the view that developing a community slash teaching oriented survey process within large scale projects is more meaningful for traditional owners. So this is not something we would be proposing obviously for very tiny exploration companies. But you know, when a company invests millions and sometimes hundreds of millions and occasionally billions of dollars in an area over one, two, three decades working with the same group of people, the idea that you just do the standard heritage survey just isn't good enough. It doesn't cut it. And there has to be a new dawn in terms of we open that process up. We allow traditional owners to help design the heritage survey process so that it is about them bringing in more members of the community. They engage in the heritage process in a way that they feel comfortable, in a way in which they can teach and take pride in it. Because it, it's their heritage, it's for them. It's not just part of the approvals process. What else do I say there? Uh, well, that is kind of what I say there, isn't it? Um, so uh, what she thinks, and I agree with her, more than that, if people, she's talking about proponents mostly here, but not just the bosses, the employees, the contractors, if they are more informed about the value of land and the value of heritage to traditional owners, the way that they see it, the way they understand these interrelationships, they may also be increasingly inclined to adopt a care for country ethos when working on country. And that's probably one of the main points I think that she would like to get across. Um, it's, so, it's so sad that she's not here in a way because she says this so well. But if we can get that across to proponents about, you know, that, then it's one, it's the big bosses, but it's kind of everyone just takes a little bit more care and, 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 um, and we kind of develop relationships. It's about developing relationships of trying and understanding. So guys, on behalf of Sharon and myself, uh, I would like to thank you. Thank you.